Karl Franz, formerly Emperor Karl Franz I of holzwig schliestein bearer of the titles Protector of the Empire, Defier of the Dark, Sigmar's heir, Emperor of the South, Emperor himself and son of emperors, is the current Emperor of the Empire of Man, the Elector Count of Reichland, the Prince of Altdorf and the greatest statesman and general the Empire and perhaps the entire Old World has seen in many centuries. Patriarch and head of House Holzwig Schlichtein, Karl Franz, who was elected to the imperial throne in 2502 IC, followed in his father the first's footsteps and was hailed as a patron of the arts and sciences, as a military innovator and as a valiant general. Thanks to his tireless efforts on behalf of his people, the empire flourished during his reign as never before. The Imperial School of Engineers in Altdorf grew, the Colleges of Magic thrived and his armies marched from victory to victory. The Emperor frequently took personal command of his troops, wielding Gal Maraz, the fabled magical warhammer given to Sigmar himself by the dwarf High King Kurgan Ironbeard over 2,500 years ago, or his Runefang sword and riding atop Deathclaw, his griffon mount of many years alongside his second-in-command and personal friend, Reichsmarschall Kurt Helborg. Karl Franz was the greatest statesman in the Old World, a great patron of the arts and sciences, innovator in military matters and a valiant warrior of great courage and tenacity. Through his efforts, the Empire prospered under his reign. The Imperial School of Engineering developed new and deadlier war machines for the benefit of the Imperial Army, while the Colleges of Magic grew in strength and size, aiding the Imperial Army in victory after victory. Karl Franz showed more skill and character than even the greatest of his predecessors, and he kept his promise to establish a strong government under a just and moral standing. Under his guidance, he skillfully managed to manoeuvre around the cults of Sigmar and Ulrich in their attempts to win his favour. When a crisis arose between the Elector Counts of Stirland and the Elector Counts of Talabakland over a dispute that dated back to the time of the three emperors, other Elector Counts waited anxiously to see which side Karl Franz would support in an event that would decide the outcome of both parties. The Emperor, however, would have none of it and decided to go to Talabheim to negotiate peace terms between the two factions. His talents as a spokesman with tremendous patience were put to the test to solve the issue, but the two rivals finally gave in to his terms and the civil war was avoided by his political genius. Other similar conflicts such as this had since been resolved by the intervention of Karl Franz, his position strengthened by the reassuring and imposing presence of Ludwig Schwarzhelm himself. The mere sight of the personal champion of the Emperor's Sword of Justice was enough to make the other Elector Counts far more accommodating and cooperative than they would have been. From what historians and scholars could understand, Karl Franz used a political tactic that would ensure that the agreement would be mutually acceptable by both parties. With his superior understanding of current politics, the Emperor won many victories by giving the people not what they wanted, but what they did not want the others to have. By using this clever political tactic, he managed to convince the merchant guilds of Altdorf to sign the famous Convention of the Stink Act in 2506 IC, from which they were required to pay huge fines and exorbitant fees, not because they believed in the concept of a cleaner Altdorf, but because they hoped that this agreement would ruin their rivals' own finances. Another notable event of his great political skill was the time when the territorial ambitions of the aggressive Theoderic Gausser upon the neighbouring province of Hochland were countered by the intervention of the Supreme Patriarch of the Colleges of Magic, Balthasar Gelt, by Karl Franz's order. Balthasar travelled to the capital city of Salzenmund the home of Count Theodoric as an ambassador of the Emperor, hoping to dissuade the Elector Count's ambitious dream of expanding his territories. Thanks to the Supreme Patriarch's magical powers of the Winds of Charmon, Balthazar secretly transmuted the gold used for the mercenaries under the Count's employ into lead. Without the gold to finance his expedition, his army would not march with him, forcing Theodoric to relinquish his claims to the lands of Hochland. However, once he discovered what had happened, 
Theodoric unsheathed his powerful Runefang crow feeder, determined to behead the sorcerer for what he had done to his precious gold. But the sorcerer was never found, for he had quickly fled the Nordland capital on his Pegasus after finalising his work in the Nordland treasury. For the longest time, the Emperor presented the facade of chastity and disattachment in order to keep the electors hopeful for a dynastic match. Rumours claimed that he had an affair with the niece of Archlector Aglim, or Duchess Elise. In fact, despite not being officially married, the Emperor had two children with his distant cousin and childhood friend, Maria Louise von Walfen, Leutpold and Alia. Luitpold was legitimised and made into the heir as the Prince of Altdorf, while his daughter Alia was officially legitimised following his marriage with Maria Louise after the turmoil, and made into his heir as the Elector Countess of Reichland. There were also rumours that Voland was none other than the bastard son of the Emperor. Voland himself never sought to affirm or contradict any of these tales, which consequently grew even more elaborate and unlikely over the years. Karl Franz is bestowed by his title as Emperor with some of the most powerful magical weapons and armour in the Old World. Although his greatest strength is masterful statesmanship, Karl Franz is nonetheless a formidable warrior. He often leads troops directly in battle, whether on horseback amongst the Reichsguard or atop his loyal Griffin Deathclaw. The Election of Karl Franz Karl Franz of House Holzwig Schliestein was born the only son of Emperor Luitpold I and his wife. In 2470 IC, when he was still a babe, he accompanied his mother, father and sister Isabella along with the imperial retinue as they travelled the Drachwald forest, being forced to stay at an inn 15 miles from the capital of Altdorf. That night, the inn was attacked by a group of beastmen who, despite the efforts of the Reichsguard and the Reichscaptain Kurt Helborg, came close to slaying the Imperial family. However, they were saved by the timely intervention of a group of Wood Elves, who slew the approaching beastmen. One of the Wood Elves asked Helborg to speak with the Imperial family, who agreed. The Elf showed no care for the Emperor's gratitude and fixed his emerald eyes on the baby held by his mother. Claiming he wouldn't harm the child, for he is far too important, the elf called the child Harathoi Koiran, meaning young king in their language, and placed a finger lightly on the baby's forehead before giving him a cryptic message. Do what your kind does best, break it, then make it whole again. The wood elves then left the inn without a further glance at the imperial family. Franz was raised in Altdorf, the capital of Reichland and the Empire, as Luitpold's heir. During his youth, he gained a reputation coveting taverns and gamblers' dens, as well as having a poor attendance record to the Temple of Sigmar, although his behaviour changed with his marriage and the birth of his son, named Leutpold, for the boy's grandfather. He was trained at fighting by the Emperor's justice, Ludwig Schwarzhelm, but his martial ability was still seen as unproven by the time he was 32. Emperor Luitpold I died in the year 2502 IC, leaving Karl Franz, the new head of House Holzwig Schliestein, with the titles of Prince of Altdorf and Elector Count of Reichland, and with Dragon's Tooth, the Reichland Runefang. However, both Sigmar's Warhammer Galmaraz and the Emperorship was to be determined by the votes of the 15 electors. Ten Elector Counts who ruled the Imperial provinces, including Franz, the Elder of the Moot, the Ar Ulric of the Cult of Ulric and the Grand Theogonist, and two arch lectors from the Cult of Sigmar. Only a week after his father's funeral had all the electors gathered in Altdorf to choose who among the counts was to rule the empire. At 32, many believed that Franz was still too young and unproven in comparison to some of the more experienced elector counts, a belief shared by Franz himself. Karl was content to live a comparatively tranquil life with his family as ruler of the Reichland, and while he voted for himself, he made it clear he did not want the throne. Nevertheless, Franz still gained four votes, while three abstained. The rest of the electors voted for Boris Todbringer, the Elector Count of Middenland, a battle-hardened and experienced warrior who spent years fighting beastmen in the Drakwald Forest. However, with eight votes, Boris was two votes shy of being electable, and thus it was decided the second round would be held a fortnight later. 
France almost got into a confrontation with the abrasive Toddbringer until Maximilian von Königswald, the Elector Count of Ostland and an old ally to France's father, diffused the situation before it escalated into a fight between Elector Counts. France left Altdorf along with Helborg and a group of Reichsguard and Halberdiers wanting to patrol the forests surrounding his new city. There, Helborg assured the new prince that the Reichsguard was personally loyal to Franz's dynasty and that Todbringer was likely to replace them as the royal guard anyway, if elected. But Franz insisted that their job was to protect whoever was elected, not to him. However, the group was interrupted by an attack from a group of forest goblins. The Imperial troops managed to hold against the Greenskins until a forest goblin shaman riding an Arachnarok spider attacked them. Franz met the creature in battle with his newly acquired Runefang, slaying both the shaman and the Arachnarok, thus causing the forest goblins to flee. The Reichlander troops rallied to their new prince, and one of the remaining Reichsguard approached Franz with a hidden dagger. The tired Karl avoided the first blow, but he would have been stabbed were it not for an ethereal green figure parrying the blade and slaying the assassin. This figure, the Green Knight, was a spirit from the neighbouring kingdom of Britannia. He revealed that he had been sent by his goddess, the Lady of the Lake, to summon Franz to a meeting with the Britannian king before a new emperor was chosen. He warned the young prince that if the Empire and Britannia could not forget their old grudges, the three-eyed king would claim victory over both, vanishing before Franz could ask further questions. Returning back to Altdorf, Franz told Helborg that he would meet with the Bretonians, but he was still unsure about trying to claim emperorship. He believed that if the Empire was facing such a great threat, it would need someone of experience like Todbringer. But Helborg defied the prince's choice. Many electors, he said, were greedy old fools that had not seen as much battle as Franz, despite their age. Helborg said that his wish to refuse the throne was a selfish one, for Franz saw the heavy toll that power took on his father. Karl could have a relatively peaceful life with his family, tending to the Reichland, but Kurt argued that would be a waste of his skills as a statesman, especially with the challenges the Empire was to face. Meeting with King Louis Leoncourt and two Bretonian dukes in his tent, the King of Bretonnia insisted on talking with Franz alone. Relaxing his arrogant demeanour, Lewin, himself only two years into his reign, explained that Franz would learn to play the role for his vassals soon enough once he took his own throne. He explained that he had not summoned Karl, for the Green Knight did not answer to him, but to his goddess, the Lady of the Lake. Not long after Emperor Luitpold's death, King Lewin explained, he was granted a vision of prophecy by the Lady. He saw the old world in ruins, with the forces of chaos reigning supreme. He understood that Britannia needed an equally strong neighbour to form a bulwark against the predations of the dark gods and their followers in the north. The empire, however, was weak and only stood a chance with Emperor Karl Franz on the throne. If humanity was to overcome chaos, the lady said, something must be broken, shattered, before it can be remade anew. However, King Lowen and Prince Karl were interrupted by an attack of orcs from the neck snapper tribe. Fighting back to back, the pair managed to hold the beasts off until their subjects dispatched the greenskin horde. With the threat defeated, Lewin told Franz to return to his capital and win the election, not for himself or for Lewin, but for the old world. Convinced by Leoncourt's words, Franz and Maximilian travelled back to the capital with the intent of convincing Todbringer's supporters to vote for the Prince of Altdorf. With only four days to go, Franz went to the Grand Temple of Sigmar to talk to the Grand Theogonist, Volkmar the Grimm, for his and his arch-lector's votes. In theory, their votes were independent of each other, but in practice, they always acted as a block of three that acted in the cult of Sigmar's interests. They had backed both Franz's father and grandfather in their elections, just like the R. Ulrich had always backed the Elector Count of Middenland. Volkmar, however, explained that he doubted Franz's piety and remembered the reputation for debauchery he had gained in his youth. He and the Archlectors had abstained, 
as they would vote neither for Franz nor for an Ulrichen. But he insisted he was open to hearing more from Karl. But when he tried to tell him about the Lady of the Lake's prophecy, Volkmar snapped at him. Enraged that Franz would listen to some foreign deity before Sigmar, the Grand Theogonist expelled him from the temple. Resorting to gain by cunning what he couldn't gain by faith, Franz arranged a meeting between himself and Maximilian with Marius Leitdorf, the Elector Count of Averland, and Hisme Stoutheart, the halfling Elder of the Moot, in order to negotiate for their votes. They meet at the back room of the Haunted Calf, a seedy tavern near the Reichsport. Marius, known as the Mad Count for his eccentric demeanour, was happy to meet with them, although Hisme was far less jovial about their meeting. He expressed that he had voted for Toddbringer last time and saw no reason not to do it again, seeing him as far more experienced. Franz tried to remind the Elder that the Moot always backed a Southern Emperor because of their closeness to them, only for Marius to taunt and downright threaten the halfling, telling him that Toddbringer won't care about the Moot once he gets into power. Franz stopped Leitdorf, wanting to rule by gaining the Elector's trust rather than their fear, and insisted that Stoutheart name his price. Hisme explained he would change his vote if Franz placed a tally tax in the River Stir, forcing the Moot's rivals at the League of Ostermark to send their wool, mutton and beer trade South Stirland and the Moot to the River Aver on their way to Nuln and Altdorf. Such a move would benefit both Avaland, Stirland and the Moot while alienating the Chancellor of Ostermark. Karl agreed to this cost and he, Maximilian and Marius left for their chambers, the elder staying to drink from the beer he would soon take a cut from. On their way home, the electors were confronted by a group of Middenland thugs who came to the city for the election. Marius responded with glee and attacked them first, shocking their attackers, though he was almost killed but for Franz's help, all while Maximilian ran to call the city watch. Before going their separate ways, Franz asked Marius if he had voted for him in the previous round, which the Avalander confirmed, insisting Karl was destined for greatness. The next day, Franz meet with Alberich Haupt Andersen, the Elector Count of Stirland, in his private chambers in the Imperial Palace for breakfast. Alberich was far more aggressive than the previous electors Franz meet, berating his late father for remaining inactive while Stirland starved. Stirland, Alberich explained, was the Empire's bastion against the undead of Sylvania, who have long gone unchecked. Franz had thought that the threat of the vampires was no more, earning the mockery of Haupt Anderson, who explained that the vampire counts still ruled in Sylvania, exploiting the people who rightfully belonged to the Empire. Once he had finished his rant, Franz assured him that if elected, they would deal with the undead threat together. He also offered Alberich to tax the River Stir to force Ostermark to move their trade through Stirland to help with their food situation, not mentioning that he had already compromised to the tax. With this, the Elector of Stirland's vote was his. After finishing breakfast, Karl met with Helmut Feuerbach, the Elector Count of Talibakland, and a rival of Ostermark, offering him part of the glory of defending the northern border to Talibakland troops, along with any trade opportunity with Kislev that Ostermark refused, which was enough to get his vote. A few hours later, Franz had lunch with Wolfram Hertwig, the Elector Count of Ostermark. Franz told Hertwig about his plans to tax the stir, but offered to make the tax dependent on distance to the capital. That way, Talibakland would be affected worse than Ostermark. He also offered to force Talibaklan to help defend the border with Kislev, once again playing the electors by offering something he has already promised, thus securing Ostermark's vote. Finally, Franz met with Theodoric Gausser, the Elector Count of Nordland, at the Celestial College just a few hours before the election. While Nordland and Middenland were allies, Franz found out no ploy was needed to change Gausser's vote only the promise that Karl's first edict would be to expel Norse raiders from Nordland's coasts. Toddbringer, confident in his victory, had kept on his quarters and relied on his followers swarming the city to intimidate the electors rather than meeting with them. The two of them made their way back to the palace when they came across a confrontation between Sigmarite and Ulrican mobs outside the Temple of Sigmar. 
Determined to stop them, Franz made his way to the middle of the crowd where, seeing their faces full of desperation and fear, all doubt that his duty was to be emperor was gone. In a grand speech, he reminded the crowd how both Ulrich and Sigmar were warrior gods of humanity, and only together could they hope to overcome the coming storm. Satisfied with the crowd's cheering, Franz left for the Imperial Palace. Making his way to the voting chamber, Franz was ambushed by an Arabian assassin, but was saved by Volkmar the Grimm, who killed the assassin with his warhammer. Unmasking his assailant, Franz recognized a mark on his neck which the Grand Theogonist identified as the mark of the Chaos God, Tzench, the Great Deceiver. Realizing where he had seen it before, the two of them ran towards the Folkschale, with Volkmark telling him that his speech showed he was ready. Acknowledging the possibility of Sigmar communing with the Bretonian's lady, Volkmar told Franz even he had problems seeing Sigmar's divine will giving him his support. The election was a short affair, with all votes bar one in his favour. Prince Karl Franz von holzweg schliestein Elector Count of Reichland, was declared Emperor. In the end, both Todbringer and the Ulrich voted for him, both because Boris saw the way the table was turning and because he wanted a strong, united empire more than he wanted the emperorship. Boris was the first to bow to him as a show of respect and extended an offer of friendship. However, since he turned all of Todbringer's voters and Marius, and both the elector counts of Hochland and Wissenland had supported him from the start, this meant the only one who could have voted against him was Maximilian, his so-called ally. Franz appeared to not be bothered by this, and the ceremony proceeded in the throne room. Nobles from across the empire came to swear fealty, priests from all major religions blessed him, and finally, Volkmar placed Sigmar's warhammer Galmaraz on his hand, crowning him as emperor. As his first act as emperor, Franz ordered Maximilian to come forward and promptly brought down Galmaraz on his head. The court was outraged until Maximilian's corpse began to liquefy into a grotesque paste, showing mutations and needle-filled mouths. As the abomination bubbled away, Karl found among its clothes Maximilian's brooch, which bore the mark of Zinch and destroyed it. The real Maximilian had been killed before the election, replaced by a servant of Zinch who was behind the many attempts of Karl's life. Emperor Karl Franz gave the title of Elector Count of Ostland to Valmir von Raukov, whose family had long been loyal to his dynasty before leaving the throne room. Franz wished to go to his private chambers, wanting to spend time with his wife and son before his time was overcome by the ruling of the empire and military campaigns. But he was informed of the need of a tour across the Reichland. Hesitantly, Karl accepted and left for his new turbulent life. The history of Karl Franz. The early years. In 2470, I see Emperor Luitpold, the first and his infant son, Karl Franz, were ambushed in the Reichwald forest by beastmen. The Reichsguard bravely defended their lord, but they were butchered by a trio of Gorgons. Just when it looked as if the Emperor and his son were about to fall to a Minotaur's axe, wood elves burst out of the forest and came mysteriously to their rescue, cutting the beastmen down in a hail of arrows before vanishing back into the trees. Leutpold I died in his sleep in 2502 IC, and in a close vote of the elector counts, Leutpold's son was elected to replace him and was crowned Emperor Karl Franz I in the High Temple of Sigmar in Altdorf. After ascending to the imperial throne, Karl Franz wished to prove to his beloved subjects that he was not a man of decadence or greed, but a man that would lead his people in their darkest of times. The Emperor decided that a show of military force could only strengthen his position as the new Emperor, and so he began a military campaign to clear the wilderness of enemy threats. Ever since the Great War Against Chaos in 2301 IC, the number of beastmen and chaos cults had steadily increased over time. The Emperor's advisers had told him that in the north the winds of magic blow strong once more, and dark omens abounded of a terrible storm that would engulf the world in war. It would take several years, or even decades, but the forces of chaos would inevitably return, driven by the expansion of the chaos wastes and the call of their dark gods. 
This resulted in a steady increase in Norse raids along the Empire's coastlines and the northern border, growing bolder and ever more numerous with each passing day, creating fear and havoc amongst the many towns and fishing villages along the coast of the province of Nordland. In response, the first act Karl Franz took as the new emperor was to march his way north at the head of a massive imperial army and reinforce the armies of Elector Count Theodoric Gausser. None of his generals or advisers had any way to predict when or where the Norse would strike next, and so he had to rely on his cadre of powerful celestial wizards to aid him in his planning, whose members possessed the mystical ability to foretell the future by observing the heavens. When the next massive raid came upon the northern shores of Nordland, the ravenous Chaos Marauders were welcomed by a volley of bullets and crossbow bolts fired by a battle line of Imperial troops. With the carefully concealed longships of the Norsemen sunk by a frightening barrage of Imperial gunfire and cannon batteries, the Norsemen had nowhere to run. Hundreds of the marauders died without a fight, their bodies driven to the bottom of the sea by the heavy bulk of their ships, and those who managed to reach the shores were met by a disciplined line of swordsmen, spearmen and halberdiers. The raiders were massacred to the last, and the emperor himself led the charge against the final shield wall of the Norse's last and most battle-hardened warriors. Since his election, Karl Franz has won victory after victory and conquest after conquest, taking command of his troops personally whenever possible, bringing with him the legendary Gal Maraz and his fellow Griffin companion Deathclaw. It was Karl Franz who led the decisive charge of the Reichsguard knights against the Knights of Britannia at the Battle of Norduin in 2502 IC. On the legendary field of blood, it was the courage of the Emperor's own heroics that steadied the Imperial line against the thunderous charge of Wah, Spleen Ripper. In his war against the eastern hordes of Morkol High the Savage, he personally led his greatsword regiment into the very heart of the enemy army and broke the skull of the Chaos Champion with a single swing of his mighty war hammer. There is little doubt that Karl Franz was one of the greatest generals of his time. He stood at the forefront of the battle against those that would have seen his beloved homeland torn asunder, a responsibility that weighed heavily upon his shoulders. The Emperor often rode into battle mounted on his loyal companion Deathclaw, the griffin he himself raised since it was a mere egg, a noble and majestic beast that is reputed to be the mightiest imperial griffin to have ever lived. A powerful bond existed between the Griffin and the Emperor, one forged in countless battles and many adventures. As the years passed, the Empire continued to grow in power and influence, and Karl Franz engaged in major projects to improve the well-being of his subjects and the common people. Reich Marshal Kurt Helborg fulfilled the will of the Emperor without question, leading the Imperial armies in combat against the ogre bandits of Tyrant Breascus, Greenskin raiders of the Broken Tooth tribe and the Skaven that infested the Howling Hills, site of the famous victory of Mandred Skaven Slayer during the Skaven Wars. The massacre along the Weiss, 2504 IC. When a great war herd of Minotaurs threatened to cross the Grey Mountains into Athel Loren, Ariel bade her spellweavers divert the swollen waters of the River Weiss and force the beasts back into the Empire. It was then that the Emperor Karl Franz did that which none of his forebears had ever done. He walked beneath the eaves of Athel Loren to seek aid. The Great Council were little inclined to accede to the Emperor's demands, for they perceived that his greatness was worn as a mantle rather than flowed from a source within. Yet nor could they deny the logic of his plea. So it was that Orion led the wild hunt over the mountains and to the Empire's aid. Whilst Karl Franz rallied the embattled army of Wissenland, Orion and Nyeth the prophetess led the swiftest riders of Athel Loren far afield and struck at the war herd's flanks. Following the path of carnage left by their King Glade riders and celebrants of Kurnus, carried their spears deep into the heart of the Minotaur's formation. Soon after, the king in the woods slew the Doom Bull, whose blood rage had begun the rampage. Decimated by disciplined handgun volleys, torn bloody by cannon fire and their most ferocious warriors, felled by the fury of the elves, the Minotaurs shrank back. 
Seeing their foes quaver, the men of the Empire gave out a great cheer, but they did so too soon. The wind shifted, and the scent of blood it carried drove the Minotaurs into a fresh frenzy. Suddenly beset by an enemy they had thought beaten, the brave men of Wissenland suffered greatly. Regiments of halberdiers and greatswords were hacked apart, filling the air with yet more blood spore and driving the Minotaurs ever more berserk. Karl Franz moved to reinforce the line, but was swept from the back of his horse by a Saiga's boulder. Even from the other side of the battlefield, Orion's keen eyes saw the Emperor fall. The king in the woods was Tom. He was weary, having been sorely wounded in battle with a colossal Gorgon, and cared little for Karl Franz's survival. As far as Orion was concerned, the human's puny life mattered naught in the wider context of the weave. Even if the Wissenlanders were routed from the field, the Wood Elves could simply withdraw behind the floodwaters of the Vice once more. Sensing Orion's indecision, Nyeth quietly reminded her liege that the fate of the world rested on more than just those born to godly mean. It did not matter, she said, if the Emperor's reach exceeded his grasp. What mattered was the nobility of his cause. Orion rounded upon Nyeth with an expression so full of fury that the seeress feared for her life. Then Orion laughed and sounded his great horn so loud that its winding was heard as far away as Athel Lauren. As one, the Wood Elves charged forward once more, this time towards the human lines and the fallen Emperor. Lost in a haze of bloodletting, the Minotaurs did not realise their danger until it was too late. Bows, sang, spears thrust forward, and the Minotaurs soon found the tide of battle turned against them. The king in the woods fought his way to the downed emperor, planted his hooves either side of the wounded man, and bellowed a challenge that the blood-maddened warherd could not deny. By the time the Minotaurs finally realised their plight and fled, near three score of their greatest champions had fallen to Orion's spear. The king in the woods had been sorely wounded in exchange. His godly ichor flowed freely from a dozen ragged wounds. But Karl Franz had not suffered so much as a single blow during the hours in which Orion had stood guard over his unconscious form. Not that the Emperor had any opportunity to thank his rescuer, for as soon as it was clear the Minotaurs had no stomach for further battle, the Elves retrieved their dead and left the field. A month later, an emissary from Athel Loren was admitted to the Palace of Altdorf. He gave no name, but delivered both a gift and a message. The gift was a single griffin egg retrieved, said the emissary, from the highest peak in the Grey Mountains. The message was simple, brought in friendship but ominous nonetheless. We will be watching. The Königswald Affair, 2505 IC. After the death of Elector Maximilian von Königswald, Karl Franz came personally to the estate of the Königswalds to express his condolences to young Oswald. Maximilian's heir. The Emperor reminisced that it was thanks to Maximilian that the original vote of eight to four against him had been overturned into support from all electors save one. He also told Oswald that he was like a father to his own son, Luitpold, and that he would gladly come to the play of his friend's great victory over Constant Drachenfels, the great enchanter. Taking the imperial court with him, the emperor enjoyed time in the field with friends and family around him and ignored warning signs, such a dream of his son, Luitpold, with levitating monks that warned him to not come to Castle Drachenfels as fancies. As he watched the play, he came to realize that the events displayed there were far too realistic to be the work of mere threater and sought to leave, but was hindered by Oswald, who forced him at knife point to remain. As Oswald von Königswald saw his plan to resurrect the great enchanter foiled by Detlef Sirk, he cut Karl Franz's throat and sought to flee, but was slain. The Emperor survived, but could only speak in a whisper for a few months. During this time, the Königswalds were stripped of their titles, which were given to the von Tassenings. Chapter 4 The Doppelganger Conspiracy During the winter, when the Emperor returned from his stay in Talabheim, a devious plot from the Scarven to replace Karl Franz with a doppelganger puppet was sprung. Members of the palace guard of the Imperial Palace had been complicit on the plot as they had been corrupted by the Slaneshi cult of the Jade Scepter. 
This plan had been engineered by the Tsinchian champion known as Skullface. The Emperor had been taken captive by the Grey Seer Gaxar within the Imperial Palace and would have died if he hadn't been saved by the Ostland warrior Conrad and the Grace of Sigmar. When his own corrupted guard tried to turn on him when the attempt to replace Karl Franz failed, Conrad the renegade wizard Litzenreich and the knight Wolfgang von Neuwald defended him. The Emperor, although weakened, promised to honour them and was escorted by two of the Templars of Sigmar to safety. Karl Franz declared Conrad a hero and his crimes forgiven, but neither he nor his companions could be found again to be honoured. The Turmoil, 2512 IC Beginning in 2512, the Emperor made a series of decisions that made some people question his sanity. Through the Reichland Diet, an emergency decree was passed which annexed Ubersreich. Its ruler, Sigismund von Jungfreud, was stripped of his title and forced to flee into his ancestral lands at the Duchy of Black Rock. Ostensibly, Karl Franz responded to recent tensions between the duchies of Wallenstein and Ubersreich. Indeed, the bill placed before the Reichland Diet in the small hours of the morning cited Graf Sigismund's belligerent and aggressive military build-up that challenged the limitations of his ducal rights as a primary reason for his removal. The Emperor acted on intelligence provided by his uncle, Emmanuel Ferrand, who had been fed false information by the Black Chamber, which had been secretly infiltrated by chaos cultists of the Purple Hand. While lesser families were keen to capitalise on the power vacuum, more astute politicians feared for future stability. After all, if the Emperor could supplant and challenge a powerful, well-established family like the Jungfreuds, what was to stop him seizing the lands of any other noble house? Trust in the Emperor was damaged and nobles throughout the Empire sought to expand their retinues of soldiers in order to defend themselves. At the same time, the Emperor began to suffer from a mysterious ailment that bound him to his bed and kept him ill and disoriented. A double was needed to keep the appearance of strength. As his mind was clouded, Shalyan reformers were able to persuade him to draft an edict that made persecution of mutants an offence, inciting the cult of Sigmar as well as numerous electors against him. Unrest followed in various cities of the Reichland, including Bogenhafen and Wittgendorf. As the situation worsened and the Sigmarian heresy flared up again in the northern provinces, the Council of State and the Grand Theogonist decided to end them by a public union. The marriage of Crown Prince Wolfgang von holzwig abenauer with Katharina Todbringer, daughter of Graf Boris Todbringer of Middenheim. Unfortunately, the wedding was interrupted by the attempted assassination of the Middenheimers through a Nordland separatist. In an emergency electoral conclave, Karl Franz was too sick to attend and had to be represented by a double. The conclave became heated and in it Boris Runefang clashed with Galmaraz and shattered it, revealing it to be copy. The destruction of the most treasured symbol of imperial unity caused the conclave to fail and imperial authority to be permanently weakened, paving the way to civil war. A group of heroes managed to retrieve the true hammer from a cavern in the Blackfire Pass, where Sigmar had once battled an exalted Lord of Change by the name Shiragetru. Unknown to all, this was part of a ploy concocted by the demon to free itself. As the ceremony was conducted, magical rifts opened over Altdorf, Bogenhafen, Ubersreich, Middenheim, Talabheim, Bechafen, Averheim, Nuln and Remus, unleashing demonic hordes upon them. Only with great sacrifices could the demon be defeated and the Purple Hand and their sinister plans for an empire dominated by chaos be thwarted. With the clouding fog of poison and sickness behind him and the true Gal Maraz in his hand, Karl Franz went on to reunite the empire. In an electoral conference, the largest reorganization of the empire since Magnus the Pious was passed. Hochland and Ostermark were restored as electoral provinces, with Schudenland and Middenland becoming parts of Middenheim and Wissenland. Talabheim and Talabekland were reunited as one province, while those who had been loyal to him were rewarded, like Marius Leitdorf and Valmir von Raukow. 
The revelation that Graf Boris's former wife, the daughter of the Baron of Nordland, had been a slanish cultist, caused a short war in which Ostland, Avaland, Ostermark, Talabicland, Wissenland, and the two arch-lectors of Sigmar supported the recreation of an electoral province Nordland under the rule of Theoderic Gausser. Third Battle of Blackfire Pass, 2519 IC. It was in that same year that Marius Leitdorf warned the Emperor when a new greenskin war poured out of Blackfire Pass and threatened to overrun the province of Averland. He responded personally to this call and went to face the Horde before it was too late, culminating in what would become the Third Battle of Blackfire Pass. The Imperial Army arrived just in time to block the entrance of Blackfire Pass from the onrushing hordes of greenskin warriors. With a battle line of Imperial soldiers holding the enemy at bay, a barrage of Imperial artillery rained down cannonballs and grape shots upon the tightly packed enemy horde. The first few waves consisted mostly of goblins and a handful of orcs, but the appearance of a berserking giant would soon threaten the Imperial line. Karl Franz, upon his griffin, personally fought the massive behemoth, but in the process, Deathclaw was injured and was forced to retreat back to the command post. With his griffin returning to the comforts of Altdorf, the Emperor watched as the battle continued its course. Time and again, the greenskins crashed against the disciplined ranks of the Imperial Army like a wave upon a cliff. After many hours of fierce fighting, a clamour arose to the northeast as a wave of greenskin warriors riding upon massive boars appeared from nowhere and tore through the Imperial artillery. Led by warlord Vorbad Ironjaw, the greenskin cavalry smashed into the left flank of the Empire battle line. Entire regiments were caught while turning their formation to face the new threat and were easily routed and butchered. A few units broke ranks and fled as panic started to spread through the Imperial army the goblins at the front lines were ruthlessly trampled to death as a new wave of heavily armoured orc warriors and massive trolls joined the fray. In a short amount of time, the Empire lines were in tatters, with only the right flank conserving some sense of its former order. Upon the centre of the battlefield, a small knot of determined greatswords stood alone in a sea of greenskins as they fought side by side with Marius Leitdorf. Warlord Vorbad drove his gigantic mount through the Greatswords Company, tossing them aside like dolls, and made his way towards the Count himself. Marius came forward to meet the monster, dodging the charging beast as he swung his rune fang in a deadly arc. The massive boar was disemboweled by the magic sword, and its rider fell to the ground. When the Warlord rose to his feet, he smashed the Elector Count into submission within mere seconds. The Warlord grabbed the Count by the throat in a powerful grip, and after a few seconds of struggle, the Count's strangled snarl was cut short by the chilling noise of bones snapping. In that instant, Marius Leitdorf was dead. Desperate to hold the enemy back from ravaging the beautiful countryside of the Empire, the Emperor lead one final assault upon the greenskin hordes. Upon his warhorse, the Emperor lead his Reichsguard knights in a massive cavalry charge that tore through the enemy ranks. As the Emperor faced the Warlord, Vorbad made a charge. Karl Franz dodged his assault and struck back with Galmaraz. The hammer hit the Orc on the shoulder, and the pain sent the Orc Warlord into a berserk fury, attacking Karl Franz with bestial ferocity. As the two fought, the battlefield around them soon stood silent as each army stopped and watched the two leaders fight it out. Though the Emperor was a magnificent warrior, Karl Franz could not overcome such a massive opponent. His strength was waning as time and again the blows began to take its toll upon his body. Finally, the Emperor began to give ground and eventually fell to one knee. At that sight, a cry of pain came from the Empire troops. Tasting victory, the Warlord savoured the moment before he prepared to deliver the killing blow. Karl Franz was overwhelmed with pain but in his heart he wished to continue, for should he have fallen that day, the lands of the Empire would be ravaged by war, plundered and its people murdered. Deep down in his heart, he prayed for deliverance, for the strength to overcome his foe, just like Sigmar had done all those centuries ago. His silent prayer was sincere and was not ignored. In that instant, a blinding aura shimmered around the Emperor's body as the hammer glowed with a fierce golden light. 
All of a sudden, his pain was gone. His muscles became filled with unearthly strength and a primal fighting spirit blossomed in his heart. As the Emperor rose to meet the huge orc once more, the warlord stopped in his tracks as the Emperor's appearance changed into a gigantic barbarian dressed in fur. The man shouted a loud battle cry that boomed amongst the mountains as it had done so all those centuries ago. Unberogens! At that sound, the instincts of the warlord were overcome by memories inscribed in the soul of his race. Memories of mighty barbarians defeating the orcs in a war for the dominion of the rich plains and driving them to the desolation beyond the mountains. In those times, these men were led by this very same champion, he who had denied the possession of this land to the Greenskins. In that moment and for the first time in his life, the warlord felt the coldness of fear upon him. The warlord stood dumbstruck, a split second of hesitation that would cost him everything. The barbarian king swung his giant warhammer at the orc skull and with a thunderous crack smote the beast down. The events of Blackfire Pass were reenacted and the greenskin horde panicked and fled the battlefield at the sight of their warlord's fall. As the warlord's life drained from his body, he saw again through his blooded eyes the wounded man in black armour and not the godlike enemy that had vanquished him. The warlord could not understand, and in defiance he raised a claw in one last futile attempt to fight back, but all his strength was gone and his arm fell back powerless before his life left him. From that day on, the name of Karl Franz has been pronounced in the Empire with even greater pride for all heard tales of the duel. And even though in years to come the stories about the battle were embellished and exaggerated, Everybody always agreed that on that day, Sigmar himself had fought alongside his descendant. The End Times During the events of the End Times, the Emperor proved his true devotion to his homeland and people by giving his life to hold back the hordes of Nurgle during the horrific siege of Atteldorf. Just as his old ally, Lewin Leon Coeur, fell fighting the Plague Father and his demonic hordes, so too did Karl Franz fight the Glotkin on to death. Outside the palace gates, Gurk Glot locked his tentacle around Deathclaw's neck as his brother Otto approached the Emperor. Karl Franz was making his last stand, somehow standing bolt upright with an expression of grim determination on his features. The Emperor of the South holding a rune sword in his off hand as his severed right arm squirted blood onto the gravel. He was pale, but determined to die with dignity. His opponent, Otto Glott, was about to attack his foe once more when a crescendo of galloping hooves gave him pause. He darted to the right and narrowly avoided having his head bisected as a white-haired warrior with elaborate plate armor hammered past with blade outstretched. The rider rose right the way around the palace fountain in a spray of gravel, coming up behind his master with a sword almost identical to that wielded by Karl Franz himself. The Emperor did not take his eyes from Otto Glotz, even as the warlord's giant brother fought to suppress the manic struggles of Deathclaw. Karl Franz's voice was steely under the pain as he greeted the Reichsmarshal who had galloped to his side. The mustachioed officer also eyed Otto with wary contempt. There was a crack of stone as Gurk hurled Deathclaw into the nearby fountain. The tension snapped and all three warriors laughed at once. Otto Glott's scythe arced down onwards Karl Franz's chest, all the force he could muster behind it. The Emperor's runic blade came up awkwardly, but he was too slow. It was his bodyguard Helborg that blocked the blow, his rune fang hooking around the scythe's wooden neck and wrenching it from Otto's grip to send it spinning across the courtyard. Growling, Otto whipped out the rusted sword at his waist before backhanding Helborg with such force that the Reichsmarshal stumbled to the ground. Bought a precious second, the Emperor plunged his rune fang hissing into Otto's chest, but his lunge missed the warlord's heart by a finger's breadth. Otto twisted and kicked, yanking the rune sword from his foe's grip and punching his own blade at Karl Franz's throat. The blow never landed. Helborg's hand grabbed the blade tight, blood seeping from his grip as the Emperor staggered back. 
Otto simply ripped the rusted blade free, severing three of the Reichsmarshal's fingers before lunging forward. The tip of the filthy sword punched into Helborg's eye socket with such force that it smashed out the back of his skull. Helborg stuted out a plea for forgiveness in the name of Sigmar before his corpse slid from the rusted blade onto the floor. Laughing, Otto rounded on the one-armed, swordless emperor, spinning the stolen runefang up in the air in an arrogant display of swordsmanship. With Deathclaw pinned in the fountain by his immense bulk, Gurk also turned to loom over the southern lord. Lightning flashed overhead as Otto raised his stolen runefang and swung it down with a roar of triumph. A thunderclap boomed high above as Karl Franz raised his good arm to deflect the blow. The blade severed it without slowing and plunged deep into the Emperor's chest. The world seemed to freeze in fear for a brief second. Karl Franz sank to the flagstones with the Glotkin triumphant above him. With his final breath, the Emperor called for his god one last time and the world was changed forever. At that moment, the searing twin-tailed comet that was souring the sky overhead smashed onto the lifeless body of the Emperor and from the impact an aura of blinding light was unleashed that saw the eradication of the unholy taint that had plagued the besieged city. From the light burst forth a tall, powerful man wielding an ancient crackling warhammer and with a mighty swing of his weapon Sigmar struck the Glotkin brothers and sent them back to the realm of chaos, never to return.